Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dear students, my name is Dr. Ajayanti, Assistant Professor of History, KSM DB College, Astangota, Kollam District of Kerala. Today, we will be studying the reasons behind the origin of Great Rebellion of 1857. The topic is subdivided into causes, cause of the revolt, causes of failure and the consequences of the Great Rebellion of 1857. First of all, the causes, causes of the rebellion of 1857. The causes of the 1857 revolt can be divided into different heads. First of all, we will be studying exploitation of the peasantry. The British derived much of them their income from land. So, they devised three different types of revenue policies in India and introduced in different parts of the country. The first revenue settlement was permanent land revenue system of settlement. This settlement was introduced in 1793 by Lord Cornwallis. In Bengal Presidency, from the very nomenclature permanent land revenue, the land tax was fixed. No reduction of land tax was made even during crop failure consequent upon the natural calamities. Under the permanent land revenue system of settlement, the peasants lost ownership of the lands and the semi-thards became the new owners. Semi-thards were the new owners of the land. Peasants became landless and they became mere tenants at will. Tenants at will. The semi-thards were required to collect land tax directly from the peasants and to pay to the British government. If the land tax was fixed 100 rupee, the semi-thards used to collect 150 rupees from the peasants. The semi-thards served as intermediaries between the peasants and the semi-thards. But it does not mean that Semindars enjoyed absolute rights. When the Semindars failed to collect land tax directly from the peasants, the Semindari rights of the Semindars were taken away and actioned to the highest bidder. From the very nomenclature permanent land revenue settlement, the land tax was fixed. There was no reduction of land tax was made even during natural calamities. So, during natural calamities, the peasants borrowed money from money lenders who charged exorbitant interest rates from the peasants. If the crop was good, in the next year he would repay his past debt. Otherwise, the lands of the peasants were taken away by the money lenders. In addition to the exploitation of the semi and the money lenders, 
the petty officials in administration also exploited the peasants. The petty officials in the administration collected money on the slightest pretext from the peasants. The law courts, administration and the police always supported the money lenders and semindars. The vicious circle, the vicious circle consisted of semindars, money lenders, petty officials in the administration. made the life of the peasants miserable and they were eagerly awaiting an opportunity to challenge the cause of all their miseries that is the British administration. The second reason behind the outbreak of the great rebellion of 1857 was the alienation of middle and upper strata of Indian society. Alienation of middle and upper strata of Indian society. Alienation of middle and upper strata of Indian society. During the period of Mughals or regional dynasties, the middle and upper strata of Indian society served in the judicial, administrative and army offices. But with the establishment of the British rule in India, these higher posters denied to the middle and upper strata of Indian society. All the higher posters of civil service, judiciary and army began to be occupied by the Britishers as a matter of right. Likewise, with the end of regional local dynasties, the dramatists, musicians and writers in these regional and local dynasties rendered unemployed. They were also ready to challenge British administration in India. The Pandits and the Maulavis The religious men who lost their former prestige and glory, all of them sided on one side against the British administration in India. The third reason behind the outbreak of the Great Rebellion of 1857 was annexation of princely states. annexation of princely states. The policy of doctrine of lapse was adopted by Lord Dalhousie, Dalhousie. Under this policy of doctrine of lapse, if an Indian ruler did not have a natural heir, his kingdom was annexed to the British Empire. By using the policy of doctrine of lapse, Lord Dalhousie annexed following kingdoms to the British Empire. Sattara was adopted in 1848 to the British Empire. Jaitpur and Sambalpur annexed to the British administration in 1849. It was followed by Nagpur and Chansi. Nagpur and Chansi were adopted to the British Empire 
in 1854. So, these were the prominent kingdoms annexed with the British Empire by Lord Dalhousie by using the policy of doctrine of lapse. In 1856, Auth was annexed to the British Empire by adopting the policy of mismanagement the British adopted out by using mismanagement that Nawab Wasid Ali Shah was mismanaging out on this pretext Nawab was annexed to the British Empire in 1856 Nana Sahib was denied pension because he was the adopted son of the last Peshwa, Peshwa Bajirao II, last Peshwa Bajirao II. But these policies brought two bitterest enemies against the British administration in India, one Rani of Chansi, second become of Auth and Nana Sahib became the bitterest enemies of the British administration because of the annexationist policy of the British government. The next reason was alien nature of the British rule. Unlike the previous invaders, the British Shays did not mix up with the Indian population. They treated even the upper caste Hindus with contempt. They came to India only to take money home. It alienated the British administration in India. Then social reforms <coughs> the practice of Sadi was abolished in Bengal presidency in 1829 by William Bendick. Then through the Macaulay minutes The column minute of 1835, English system of learning was introduced in India. Then, Widow Remarriage Act was introduced in India. Widow Remarriage Act was introduced in India in 1856. For these liberal socio social reforms, like the abolition of Sadi in Bengal Presidency in 1829 by William Bendick and the introduction of the Western learning through the Macaulay minutes of 1835 and the introduction of the Widow Remarriage Act in 1856 irked the Orthodox Indians next reason was the taxation of lands held by religious institutions. In olden days, the lands owned by the temples and the mosques were exempted from the payment of land tax, but the British introduced land tax on the lands possessed by religious institutions of temples and mosques. It affected the religious feelings of the both Hindus and Muslims. Impact on the Shibois.
no doubt the rebellion originated among the shivois most of the shivois came from out region there were around 75000 shivois from out alone out alone most of these shivois joined the british service as shivois in order to supplement their fast declining agricultural income due to the land revenue policies adopted by the british government as we have seen earlier the land revenue policies of permanent land revenue system of settlement or right wary system of settlement or mahalwari system of settlement each oppressed than the other imbu versus the presentary in these circumstances these she boys joined the british service but once they joined the british service as she boys they soon realized the realized that the capacity doing so declined over and above the indian she boy was paid only 7 to 9 rupees per mensum 9 to 7 rupees per month out of the 7 to 9 rupees per mensum the shivois used to meet the expenses on uniform food and transport of private luggage the cost of maintaining an indian shivoi was only one third of british boy one third of british boy again even with the great fighting capacity and value the shiboy is could rise only up to the post of subedar all other higher posts of subedar were given only to britishers again the indian shivois were humiliated and treated roughly at the religion next threat to religion threat to religion christian missionaries Christian missionaries always tried to convert Hindus and Muslims into Christianity. In addition to that, chaplains were maintained. Chaplains were maintained by the government in army for converting Hindu and Muslim shipwrights into Christianity. at the government cost these chaplains were maintained by the government for converting hindu and muslim shivois into christianity the hindu and muslim shivois were also not allowed to wear any kind of caste marks caste marks were not allowed in the army in 1856 general service enlistment act was passed general service enlistment act in 1856 general service Enli- enlistment act was passed by the british under this act every new recruit to the army was required to enter a bond with the british government that they would serve overseas if required by the british administration 
since most of the Sibois belong to upper caste Hindus, crossing the sea was considered as loss of caste. In 1824, 47th regiment, 47th regiment at Barakpur. was asked to go to Burma, but the regiment declined to obey the orders of the British administration. Pursuant to this, the regiment was disbanded and disobeying soldiers were hanged to death. Now, we will be discussing the immediate causes behind the outbreak of the rebellion of 1857. immediate causes. The British introduced a new Enfield rifle a new Enfield rifle in the army. The cartridge of the Enfield rifle had a paper cover and the end of which had to be bitten off before loading cartridge into rifle. During this time, a rumor spread that the fat of the cartridge was made from cow or pig. Cow was holy for Hindus and pig was unholy or haram to Muslims. It enraged the religious sentiments of the Sibois and they considered that their religion was in danger. It provided the immediate background of the great rebellion of 1857. Thus, the rebellion started on 10th May. 1857. But these were the reasons behind the outbreak of the Great Rebellion of 1857. Exploitation of the peasantry, alienation of the middle and upper strata of Indian society, annexationist policies of the British government in India, alienation alien nature of the British rule, social reforms and the taxation of the lands possessed by religious institutions of temples and mosques, flights of the Shibais and threat to religion were the reasons behind the outbreak of the rebellion of 1857. The Cardin episode provided the immediate reason behind the outbreak of the Great Rebellion of 1857. Now, we study the beginning of the Great Rebellion of 1857. The revolt began on 10th May 1857 at Meerut and the rebellion originated among the Shibois at Meerut. From Meerut, the Shibois marched to Delhi. Once the Shibois reached Delhi, they declared Bhagatur Shah second as the emperor of India and the revolt spread to other parts of the country. The main sendates, the main sendates of the rebellion of 1857 were Delhi, Kanpur, Lucknow, Bareilly, Jansi and Array. These were the 
prominent descendants of the rebellion of 1857. In Delhi, Bagadusha II was the leader. However, since he was old, the popular leader was Fakti Khan. Fakti Khan provided leadership to the rebellion in Delhi. In Kanpur, Nana Sahib but on behalf of the Nana Sahib, the actual leadership was provided by none other than Tandia Topi. Tandia Topi provided leadership to the rebellion in Kanpur. In Lucknow, Begum of Auth she declared her son Birjis Kodir. as the Nawab of Auth, but the popular leader was Maulavi Ahmadullah. Maulavi Ahmadullah of Faisabad was the popular leader of the rebellion of 1857 in Lucknow. In Chansi, Rani Lakshmi Fai. Rani Lakshmi Fai provided leadership to the rebellion of 1857 in Chansi. In Are, Converse provided leadership to the rebellion of 1857. But despite stiff resistance provided by these leaders, the Britishers suppressed the rebellion ruthlessly. British recaptured Delhi on 20 September 1857. Delhi was recaptured by British on 20 September 1857. It was a serious blow to the rebels. Bagadusha was taken as a prisoner and he was deported to Rangoon, where he died in 1862. Bagadusha died in 1862 at Rangoon. Nana Sahib was defeated at Kanpur and he escaped to Nepal. escaped to Nepal. Tantya Topi was also captured and put to death by the Britishers in April 1859. Rani of Chansi died while heroically fighting against the British. Begum of Auth, she escaped to Nepal. By the end of 1859, most of the leaders were either captured or put to death and the British authority was re-established. Now we will be discussing the circumstances behind the causes of the failure of the Great Rebellion of 1857. One of the prominent reasons behind the failure of the Great Rebellion of 1857 was lack of unity among the Indians. Causes of the failure of revolt of 1857. What were the reasons behind the failure of the rebellion of 1857. One of the most prominent reasons behind the 
failure of revolt of 1857 was that lack of unity among the Indians. lack of unity among the Indians. While the Shibois of Bengal out were revolting against the British administration, the Shibois in Bombay and Madras armies, Bombay and Madras armies helped the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion. Further, there were no accompanying rebellions in South India or in Western India or in Eastern India. And many forces supported the British in the suppression of the rebellion of 1857. The Sikhs in Punjab, The Sikhs in Punjab supported the British in the suppression of the rebellion of 1857. The Rajaputs in Rajabutana, Nisam of Hyderabad, the Sikhs in Punjab. Rajabuts in Rajabutana and Nisam of Hyderabad supported the British in the suppression of the rebellion of 1857. They had their own reasons to support the Britishers. For example, the Sikh, they feared the revival of the Mughal rule in India because it was during the period of Jahangir. The fifth Sikh Guru was put it to death. Aurangasim also put it to death. The ninth Sikh Guru Tej Bahadur. The sixth, that is why the Sikhs feared the revival of the Mughal rule in India. So they support the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion. The Rajabuts in Rajabutana and the Nisam of Hyderabad supported the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion. Why? The Rajabuts and the Nisam of Hyderabad feared that if the Britishers were de defeated, the Marathas would come back to power in Western India. It was against the interest of Rajabuts and the Nisam of Hyderabad. Nisam of Hyderabad and Marathas engaged in protracted struggles. Earlier, the Marathas occupied the territories of the Rajabuts. So, the Rajabuts and the Nisam of Hyderabad had their own reasons to support the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion of 1857. Likewise, the Semintars were the products of the British administration in India. They had all the reasons to support the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion of 1857. Likewise, big merchants in Calcutta, Bombay and Madras also supported the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion because the merchants got profit with their relations with the British merchants. So, these big merchants had all the reasons to support the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion of 1857. The money lenders also extended support to the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion of 1857. From this, there was no unity among the Indians in this rebellion against the Britishers. Second reason was that lack of support from educated Indians.
lack of support from educated Indians. The educated Indians did not uh, support the rebels. Why did the educated Indi why did not the educated Indians support the rebels? The educated Indians mistakenly believed that British administration would lead our country into modernization. That is why the educated Indians did not uh, support the rebels in the rebellion of 1857. But later these educated Indians realized the fact that British administration would not lead our country into modernization, but only economic exploitation. Next reason was military superiority. military superiority of the British. The rebels used medieval type weapons, while the British used modern weaponry. Sheer courage could not win against the determined enemies. The Indian soldiers lacked unity and discipline and lack of modern weaponry, while the British got constant supply of arms, ammunition, money, men and material. Even with great fighting capacity and great value, the Indian soldiers could not win over the Britishers. Lack of disunity among the disunity among the leaders. The leaders lacked unity and unified program and ideology. They were not the national leaders. Most of them came forward to provide leadership for personal reasons, not for the national cause. And they quarreled with each other on petty issues. These were the reasons behind the failure of the Great Rebellion of 1857. Now, we will be discussing the impact of the Great Rebellion of 1857. Impact of the Revolt of 1857 of which the first and foremost was the transfer of power, transfer of power. An act was passed in 1858, otherwise known as Queen Victoria Proclamation, Queen Victoria Proclamation. Under this proclamation, the Indian administration was directly taken over by British Crown from English East India Company. From English East India Company. One of the first change introduced after the Great Rebellion of 1857 was that the administration of India was taken over by British Crown from English East India Company. But in fact, the actual administration was not carried out by British Crown, but in the name of British Crown, 
the actual administration was carried out by the secretary of state for india secretary of state for india secretary of state for india actually carried out the indian administration on behalf of the british crown a council popularly known as india council was also created consisting of 15 members to help the secretary of state for india in running the administration of government of india this was the first major change effected immediately after the great rebellion of 1857 was over the next major change after the rebellion of 1857 was that a new nomenclature was given to governor general the new nomenclature was viceroy for the governor general henceforth would known as viceroy these were the major administrative changes introduced after the rebellion of 1857 changes in the army what changes were effected by the British in the army? As we have seen earlier, the revolt of 1857 was originated in the army. The British government made every efforts to prevent another such rebellion in the army. One of the major changes effected in the army was that the number of European soldiers increased and the ratio of British and Indian soldiers was fixed at 1 is to 2 in Bengal army that is when one British soldier was recruited two Indian soldiers were recruited. The ratio of British and Indian soldier was fixed at 2 is to 5 in Bombay and Madras. In Bombay and Madras when two British soldiers were recruited, recruited five Indian soldiers were recruited. But the ratio between British soldier and Indian soldier was increased and it was fixed at 1 is to 2 in Bengal army while the ratio was 2 is to 5 in Bombay and Madras armies. The next major change effected in army was that artillery was exclusively put under the hands of British soldiers. Indian soldiers were not allowed to enter into artillery where arms and ammunition were kept. Next, the key geographical and strategically important places, strategically important places were put exclusively under the hands of the British soldiers. Next major change effected in the army was that the policy of divide and rule was introduced in army. Battalions and regiments began to be recruited based on caste, community, religion and region. Since the revolt of 1857 originated in the army, every efforts were made by the Britishers to prevent the development of nationalist feelings among the soldiers. Newspapers, periodicals were prevented from reaching the soldiers, otherwise it would cause the development of nationalist feelings among the soldiers. Then next change. the 
the solids from Panchap Patans Kurkas were declared martial. The solids from these areas of Punjab or Padans or Gurkhas, they supported the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion of 1857. Hence, the soldiers from these areas were declared as Punjab, Padans and Gurkhas and they were massively recruited. Punjabis, Padans and Gurkhas were largely recruited while out soldiers from out Bihar and central India. They actively participated in the rebellion of 1857 against the British. So, they were declared as non martial and they were not sufficiently recruited into the British army while the recruitment of Punjabis, Patans and Gurkhas were given more importance. Moving on, these were the major changes introduced in the army. Now, we go into the third major change introduced in India by the British immediately after the rebellion of 1857 was over. The policy of divide and rule. The policy of divide and rule was introduced not only in the army, but also in the civil population. Initially, the Britishers thought that the rebellion of 1857 was a conspiracy hatched by the Muslims. So, a discriminatory attitude was followed by the Britishers towards the Muslims and they were punished for taking part in the rebellion of 1857 by confiscating their lands. But this attitude began to change by 1870s an appeasement policy, an appeasement policy well, began to be followed by the British towards the Indian Muslims. And this appeasement policy by favoring Indian Muslims resulted the development of communalism in India later. The next effort of the British was to break the Hindu Muslim unity during the period of the rebellion of 1857. Hence, they adopted measures to turn Hindus against Muslims, one province against another province. For these were the measures adopted by the British under the policy of divide and rule among the civil population. Nalam, uh, the fourth impact after the rebellion of 1857 was that new policy was adopted towards the princes. Before the rebellion of 1857, the princes were not allowed it to adopt heirs. But after the rebellion of 1857, the Indian princes were allowed to adopt heirs and this policy was used by the Britishers to reward those princes who actively supported the Britishers in the rebellion of 1857. And the next major change introduced after the rebellion of 1857 was in public services that is merit system of civil service was introduced. Merit system of civil service was introduced by the British in India in 18. 58. Under this system, Indians were also allowed to compete in the civil services examination along with the Britishers. However, 
the merit system of civil service was introduced in India in 1858, only few Indians would enter into civil service, because the examination was held far away in London, thousands of kilometers far away from India. Secondly, the questions were heavily based on the knowledge of English, Latin and Greek. These were unfamiliar to Indians. The third reason was that the upper age limit for appearing this coveted civil services examination was reduced from 23 in 1858 to 19 in 1878 by Lord Lipton. Because of these reasons only few Indians entered into the coveted civil service. Next change, attitude towards princess. Earlier, by adopting the policy of doctrine of laws or mismanagement, territories were annexed to the mighty British Empire. But because of adverse reaction, the British decided not to adopt any territories to the British Empire. Earlier, by adopting doctrine of laws or mismanagement, Indian territories were adopted to the mighty British Empire. Now, they discontinued the policy of doctrine of lapse or mismanagement. Next, social reforms. Earlier, the British introduced social reforms, including Widow Remarriage Act of 1858, abolition of Sadi in 1829. It attracted adverse dia reaction from the orthodox sections of Indian society. Hence, it was decided not to adopt such a kind of social reforms. So, these were the major changes introduced after the Great Rebellion of 1857. Now, we will be discussing the nature of Rebellion of 1857, nature of the revolt of 1857. The historians or scholars do not have a unanimous opinion about the nature of the revolt of 1857. Certain scholars argue that it was a Shibai Mutuni, while other scholars argue that it was a national war of independence, while other scholars argue that it was a struggle between black and white or struggle between barbarism and civilization. We now go into details of one by one. First of all, we will be looking into whether the revolt of 1857 was a Shivai Mutuni or not. These historians John Lawrence and John Seeley argue that the Great Rebellion of 1857 was a mere Shibai Mutuni and it did, it did not command the support of the majority of the population. The Britishers as the constituted government of the day suppressed the rebellion and restored law and order. 
This is the opinion tended by these historians John Lawrence and Seeley. Whether the explanation is adequate and satisfactory? The answer is exactly no. First of all, not all the Shivois took participation in the rebellion of 1857. Secondly, all the participants were not Shibois. Civil population, dispossessed Semindars, peasants also took a participation in the rebellion of 1857. So, how can you say that it was a mere Shibai Mutuni? No doubt, the rebellion originated among the Shibais, but they were joined by the civil population, particularly disposers of Semindars and the peasants. During the trial of rebels in 1858-59, many peasants were also found guilty in taking part of the rebellion. So, we cannot consider the great rebellion of 1857 as a mere Shiboy Mutani as observed by scholars like John Lawrence and John Seeley. The second version relating to the nature of rebellion of 1857 comes from L. E. R. Rees. L. E. R. Rees states that the rebellion of 1857 was a religious war it was a religious war against christianity for the second opinion is provided by elias who consider the great rebellion of 1857 as a religious war against the Christianity. No doubt, the Britishers won the rebellion, but not the Christianity. Likewise, Hindus and Muslims were suppressed in the rebellion, but not their respective religions. Hence, the opinion tended by Elia Rees is also not satisfactory regarding the nature of the rebellion of 1857. Now, we go to the third opinion. It was a struggle between black and white. Who were the black? Indians were considered as black. The Britishers were considered as white. No doubt, all the whites were ranged on one side, but not all the blacks. Certain blacks supported the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion. So, we cannot consider the rebellion of 1857 as a struggle between black and white, since many blacks, as we have seen earlier, the six Rajabuts. Shiva is from South India and helped the Britishers in the suppression of the rebellion. But all whites ranged on one side. So, we can consider it was a struggle between white supported by some blacks and black. The fourth opinion comes from T. R. Holmes. What is the argument of T. R. Holmes? T. R. Holmes <coughs> argues that it was a struggle between civilization and barbarism. But T. R. Holmes argues that the rebellion of 1857 was a struggle between civilization and barbarism. Who were civilized? The Britishers were considered as civilized and Indians were considered as 
barbaric. Why did Indians consider as barbaric? Because Indians engaged in the killing of European women and children. That is why Indians were considered as barbaric. But similar kinds of barbaric activities were committed by the Britishers as well. For example, Hudson who engaged in indiscriminate firing of Indians at Delhi. <coughs> Another Britisher, Neil, who took pride in the hanging of Indians without any trial whatsoever. These were civilized activities, no, these were barbaric activities. So, we consider, we cannot consider these Britishers as civilized. They committed the same barbaric activities as the Indians. So, we cannot consider the great rebellion of 1857 as a struggle between civilization and barbarism. James Audra, another scholar who states that the rebellion of 1857 was a Hindu-Muslim conspiracy. He states that the Muslims conspired the rebellion by highlighting the flights of the Hindus. This was the opinion tended by James Audra. This explanation is also not satisfactory. Benjamin Disraeli, a conservative leader in Britain who states that the Great Rebellion of 1857 as a national uprising. Benjamin Disraeli who states that the Great Rebellion of 1857 as a national uprising. Similarly, B. D. Savarkar B. D. Savarkar in his book Indian War of Independence This book was published in London in 1909. In this book, B. D. Savarkar states that the rebellion of 1857 was a planned war of independence. Planned war of independence. Well, Benjamin Disraeli argues that the rebellion of 1857 was a national uprising. V. D. Savarkar in his book entitled Indian War of Independence published in 1909 in London argues that the Great Rebellion of 1857 was a planned war of independence. Now, we will be looking into whether the Great Rebellion of 1857 was a national or not. No nationalism during the period of the rebellion. Nationalism was only in an embryo form during the rebellion of 1857. During this period of rebellion, Hindustanis, Maharashtrians or Punjabis did not think that they belonged to the same nation. Nationalism was only in an embryo form during the great rebellion of 1857. And no national leaders Rani Lakshmi Fai joined the ranks of the rebels. 
only to save his, her territories. If her territory was restored, she would withdraw from the rebellion. Likewise, Nana Sahib joined the ranks of the rebels only after his mission in London was failed. They were not uh, national leaders. Nationalism was only in an embryo form during the period of the rebellion of 1857. In such a case, how can we call the rebellion of 1857 as a national uprising? The rebellion of 1857 cannot be considered as a national uprising because of these reasons. Nextly, we will be looking into whether the Great Rebellion of 1857 was planned or not as observed by V. D. Savarkar. It was V. D. Savarkar who stated in his book that the Rebellion of 1857 was a planned war of independence. The British made all efforts to know whether the rebellion of 1857 was planned or not. During the trial of Bagadur Shah II, during the trial of the Bagadur Shah II, it was clear that the rebellion was a surprise to Bagadur Shah surprise to Bagadur Shah. As to the Britishers, the old Mughal prince Bagadur Shah was declared by the Shivois as the emperor of India. Bagadur Shah did not involve any process of planning of the rebellion of 1857, but the rebellion was neither national nor planet as observed by Benjamin Disraeli and B. D. Savarkar. Karl Marx opined that it was a soldier person's campaign against the foreign and a feudal bondage, but failed due to bourgeoisie or feudal betrayal. This was the opinion tended by Karl Marx regarding the rebellion of 1857, combined struggle of peasants and the soldiers against for against feudal bondage. This was the opinion tended by Karl Marx regarding the nature of the rebellion of 1857. But in this rebellion, dispossessed Semindars also took a participation. So the observation made by Karl Marx is also inadequate and not satisfactory. Vivan Chandra, the great historian on modern India, he opines that there was no program, program or planned action after the defeat of the British. This was the opinion tended by Vivan Chandra, that is the, so, the Shibu, Indian Shivais who took participation in the rebellion did not have any plan of action once they succeeded in the rebellion. This was the opinion tended by Vivan Chandra. No plan of action. once they won the rebellion. Next opinion is from Tarachand, another historian Tarachand.
Tara Chand argues that it was the last attempt of the Indians to restore the old order of the day, old order of the day before the arrival of the British. For these were the different opinions tended by scholars and historians regarding the nature of the rebellion of the 1857. In conclusion, I may say that there is no unanimity among the scholars or historians regarding the nature of rebellion of 1857. Thank you. Thank you.